Hello, everyone. I see we have a, a crowd here, but we also have a crowd, I think, that will be coming over from our uh, TCFG reading group that uh, is from 12 to 1. So, so you, Lulu, ex uh, please expect a few more people as well. Um, welcome back, everyone, uh, to this, uh, boy, I think it might be third annual series of TCFG seminars. This is a once a month uh, Friday uh, event on the first Friday of every month where we bring in experts from all around the country to talk about issues uh, regarding how to make uh, the power grid resilient and trustworthy. Um, we are have quite a full uh, uh, selection of speakers already for the fall. You can go to our website, uh, tcipg.org, to see those details. Um, and uh, we're really pleased to have a, a speaker uh, from the University of Tennessee. Uh, I'm going to hand over uh, the mic now to, to Pete Sauer, who will introduce her, and then we look forward to her presentation. Okay, thank you, Bill, and welcome, everyone. We're coming to you live from beautiful Urbana, Illinois, and we're very pleased to have a, what I consider a distinguished speaker, a lady who came to us from China through a Big Ten school, Ohio State, where she got her PhD with Steve Sebo, and then she went to Virginia Tech, where she got involved with these PMU people, uh, Aaron Fadke and Jim Thorpe, but she is now a professor at the University of Tennessee and also a joint appointment with Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So she keeps her feet in the real world and she is also an associate director of a new National Science Foundation Engineering Research Center called Current, C-U-R-E-N-T. And I won't talk about that. She'll give you a little taste of what it is. But she is quite famous for a thing called FNET, who I heard a, a gentleman from NERC say to us that of all the resources he had available to him after the 2003 blackout, it was the FNET database and using that to diagnose what happened and to monitor and look at, at how things were restored. So it has already, her, her invention has already gotten a lot of notoriety for post-disturbance analysis of events uh, since that time. And without any more of my talk, uh, I'm pleased to introduce you to Yi Lu Lu from the University of Tennessee and Oak Ridge. All right, thanks, Pete, and thanks, Bill. I'm very happy to be invited. It's quite an honor for coming to talk uh, at such a great university. Uh, what I will do, I think uh, my director gave me uh, the order that I needed to introduce the center just briefly, and uh, then I get into the FNET, <laughs> FNET and Great Ive stuff. All right. I make the same rule. All right, good. All right. Uh, okay. So NSF centers are uh, usually five-year and typically ten-year centers, and uh, we haven't had uh, a lot of luck for the power system area. We had some before. Uh, Arturo in the audience, you know about CPAS, uh, and then we had Alex Huang's group at uh, NC State, and that's also distribution level. Uh, one is power electronics, one is uh, distribution integration. So this particular one we applied and eventually got funded through NSF and DOE together is focused on uh, wide area. Basically we named it uh, ultra wide area resilient electric energy transmission network. Basically the major trunks of uh, transmission grade of the country. Um, the schools that are participate, our partners are Northeastern, uh, Rasselier, and uh, as well as with uh, Tuskegee. We have several international groups. Those are Tsinghua, uh, 
ANSYS, uh, National Technical University of ANSYS, and uh, University of Waterloo. Uh, both have uh, different expertise that build uh, to the group. And we have a scientific advisory board uh, where we have distinguished scientists, the CEOs, including Terry Boston and uh, our distinguished Pete Sauer <laughs> in the committee. So that's probably why uh, I was brought here. Okay, so the center basically, this is an older slide, I apologize for that, and we had 43 companies, later on a few more, um, actually wrote support letters to be joined in the center, and uh, this is a multi-campus, multi-discipline operation. Uh, Karen, uh, Kevin uh, Tomsovic is the director. Uh, let me, uh, so in a very simple way, the center has a very uh, uh, simple focus, basically use the wide area measurement technology to be able to operate and control and protect our power grid uh, from a large system point of view. And uh, the reason we have to think about this now, and you would say, okay, the power grid been working fine, why is this new? Well, this is new because we have renewables uh, as being the next challenging coming to the system, and they're intermittent, and uh, they're also uh, unpredictable in uh, a lot of senses, and the power grid, once you have enough of those, will become something totally different, and you have to have a new approach to handle uh, a grid that's uh, very different nature of it. So that's, that's basically, and the timing is, um, perfect for this because right after the stimulus funding, we have a lot of de uh, PMU de deployment, roughly about 1,000 in the country. Uh, so you have a wide area measurement points, data available, and uh, the communication uh, should be mature enough to handle a lot of the delays and requirements for control and, com uh, and other purposes. And when you put all those together, plus possibility of uh, fax device using uh, PSS, as well as the new green energy, basically wind and others, which is tied to the fast power electronics. Those can be our actuation devices, actuators. So you not have measurement, you have communication, you have actuation, you can put those together to be able to control and run the power grid better, and this is basically uh, the theme of uh, the center, okay? Um, the way the center is structured is basically you are required to have system level uh, projects, those are test beds, or a smaller version, a scaled version of the system you're studying, and uh, also you have to have uh, fundamental enabling technology thrust areas. And vertically, okay, I need to get this mouse to work. Okay, it's working. Okay, so vertically we divided the center thrust into several areas, that including monitoring, which is measurement, and uh, modeling, which include large system studies and modeling components, and modeling many other things, uh, including communication delays control and actuation. So those are the major areas we divide the center into technical thrust areas. And one example of the test bed we are looking at is to uh, divide the power grid into clusters, dynamic clusters, okay? And you probably are quite uh, familiar with the clusters on the west with the rain system. But the yeast system, based on our observation, is actually very like three, actually four machines. The centerpiece, which is the majority of the system, is one machine. The east, northeast is another one, and the, the northwest is another one, and the, the Florida area is another one. So this is the simplest way of representing the east uh, grid. And Texas, let's say we use one to represent the Texas area, okay? So basically you can, in a simplest way, to emulate or represent 
uh, the entire US uh, or North America grid into several clusters, 12 or some clusters. And that's what the hardware test bed will be for the center. And together with that, we will have uh, simulation tools and uh, large system models that models up to the very details of it. So this gave you pretty much uh, an overview uh, of what the center is about. And it started a year ago. This is, we're getting to the second year now. And five year, we will up to uh, the renewal. And potentially, it gets to the 10 year span, which is about $40 million. And the good thing about the center uh, coming jointly with DOE is DOE is able to actually help Oak Ridge uh, with additional funding and uh, also being able to pipe in um, uh, more support into the center. Well, NSF, you're confined with the, the basic budget. Yeah, so that's, that's been very, very helpful. Okay, all right, so let me go into uh, the, the FNET. Uh, system. Uh, basically, you can see on the logo on the bottom, it's a FNAT grid eye. Uh, I almost wear that shirt. I regret not doing that. <laughs> okay, so what happened is uh, the FNAT we started in uh, at Virginia Tech, and the, when I moved to uh, University of Tennessee and become part of the staff of uh, the Oak Ridge National Lab, and we have a joint effort. Actually, this be, it's a joint-owned system between UT and the uh, Oak Ridge National Lab. So the grid I version was added after that, yeah. Uh, we have been through several versions of the ha hardware. Uh, we were talking about what exactly the box is. It's actually a single-phase PMU. And we were talking about debating, is it a PMU? If it measures phasers, yes, it is a PMU. However, uh, it, since it's built to connect to uh, distribution level, actually in, in the office and uh, residential level, at 110 uh, in European and other parts, it's 220. It's actually not measuring current because the current has much less significance. So it's only taking the voltage signal. That's the distinction between the PMU and the, and the FDR. And also, it, uh, it doesn't do three phase. Okay. It takes single phase. Uh, so basically, it takes the voltage signal and uh, it uh, calculates the phaser. Phaser, in the simplest term, would be the angle of a voltage signal. It can be a current phaser, which would be the angle of a current signal. Or in other words, it's when it crosses zero, okay? But it used the uh, FFT, the Fourier uh, phaser algorithm instead of zero crossing. I think the Schweizer unit used zero crossing for calculating frequency. And this one, you start with the phaser to so calculate the phase angle, and then you do the derivative of some sort, well, and then you get the, the frequency information. And of course, you naturally get the voltage information because you're taking voltage signal. Okay. Um, here's the rough map of uh, uh, the deployment site in uh, North America. And uh, we have close to 200, but you know, you, you're always in trench and some come in, some goes back. We went through several versions, and the old version is all called back twice. And the first time we upgrade the, the firmware, the second time when I move, and uh, we call the old unit back to Virginia Tech, and we have to redeploy new units uh, at U, uh, UT and uh, Oak Ridge. Okay. And uh, worldwide, we also deploy them uh, in different parts of the world. We are sending some to Japan, um, and uh, I like to really cover Russia. And, yeah, so. We, we, we try to basically cover all the major grid, and we have a major interest in the grids where it has a lot of wind renewables to give us uh, some kind of a pre, you know, information before we, our own grids get into that percentage, get a, get, give us some uh, ideas. And we get to a small areas as Hawaii, where we look at the very small system. What do they look like? And how do they behave? Yeah. So, all right. So what I will do, you're going to find out 
in the rest of the presentation is uh, what we use those for, okay? And a long term, this is the, you know, the, the motivation of doing this is because, you know, Virginia Tech being the place where we, uh, Aaron Fetke and, and uh, Jim and others invented the PMU concept. But once the PMU gets deployed, and there, we never get enough data. We never get really data to, to do the study. So this, this is built in order to collect data on our own, to be not restricted by location, by utility boundaries, and be able to do research. Okay. So what can we do with those data? Um, the first thing we uh, stumbled into uh, well, not totally stumble into because there were indications there was a need for that uh, because of the trading company, is to be able to pinpoint location of uh, event. Uh, event being a generator trip or uh, it could be a load shading, and the event can also extend to line trips and other events. But typically, it's very easy to do large system, large outages uh, where you have thousands of megawatt lost, or even hundreds of megawatt lost. So what I'm showing here, this is a very, this is an earlier, you can see this 2005, where there's a very limited number of units. And you can also see that you, different locations, you can get the frequency change actually time-wise lined up differently. So there's a kind of delay, uh, in terms of seeing an event. And this is very much like earthquake where the, there's a traveling of the event from the source to the observation point, okay? Now, you can use that phenomenon because of the finite speed of the traveling, which is not speed of light, which is much, much slower than the speed of light. It's actually about 500 miles per second in the east, maybe a thousand on the west coast. You can use, take advantage of that traveling speed, and you can use the time delay of arrival to triangulate back where the events are. And this is a typical case uh, uh, example. And uh, actually, one of the company who does the uh, generation for um, this, this company, Genscape, actually does a lot of work for the traders and, and uh, provide them information on generation outages and bought one of our patents for this uh, technology, okay? So this, basically this figure shows where the actual uh, location of an event and the triangulated event. Uh, you can get reasonably accurate with very few units. And as you increase the density, it becomes a very uh, straightforward process. And you can get the estimate for the Magnitude, the magnitude based on uh, basically the distance between before the drop and after the drop of the frequency when you have a generator and drop, and that can be get, uh, detected very accurately. Okay, so this is a typical uh, alert system that automatic gets sent out, and this, and you're talking about Bob Cummings, and he he gets one of those on his uh, iPhone, so he would be the first one. Well, he would be among the first one to know if something happened. Usually, within even utility, they don't necessarily know, so they have to, you know, cross divisions to to know what happened in the system. It becomes even more difficult to know something happened in somebody else's system. So this become a, a tool for people to understand what's going on in the in the power grid, and the automatic alert goes to the industry group consortium members and DOE, FERC, NERC, and a bunch of other agencies, okay. All right, so this is the thing we've been fiddling around and, uh, and basically this gives you a feel of why we can uh, detect things based on uh, the traveling. And you can notice that an event happened here, it does propagate slowly, goes to uh, other part of the country. It takes two or three seconds to be able to reach uh, from Florida to uh, New England and uh, further. And after that, you see out oscillations 
And those are actually all recorded data. Uh, it's not a simulation, it's an actual uh, recording. So, so the system provides us a very complete view of what's going on in terms of disturbance, oscillations in the grid. Uh, a second uh, application, you can easily watch oscillations in the system, and you can observe the mode, you know, at what frequency they uh, oscillate. Here you have an inter-area oscillation that gets you to about 2 point, uh, 0.2 hertz or so, below 0.5 hertz, okay? And this is a typical oscillation grouping where you have the northwest, northeast, and the, the central and south kind of swing against each other. Okay. And, and so there's an automatic process that generates the oscillation report. And I'll show you a, I'm going to show you a, a polished version later on. Okay. And uh, here's another one. Once I pass those two, I'm all set in terms of testing this computer. Okay, here's another event and that uh, we're using those for the NASP study. This is the one, I lose my, okay, let me go back. All right. Okay, here we go. Okay, so this is actually a storm that actually took out a lot of 500 kV lines on the TVA system, and this created a very severe oscillation in the, in the power grid, and this is what you would see uh, if you look at the entire system as a whole, rather than observing in, in different pieces uh, of the grid. Okay. Your, your scale's quite a bit different on this one than on the other one. Um, you mean the frequency, oh, you mean the, the color scale? Yeah, I think what they are doing is they choose the uh, very different color scale so that each, uh, each movie, they pick a different color scale so they can use the whole co full color. Yeah, not being very consistent on that. They wanted to get all the colors to participate for all the events. You're right. <laughs> all right, so this is a typical oscillation report uh, that goes out automatically whenever there's an oscillation happen in the grid. Uh, we can. Now we're getting, you're getting, you could get about 40 some of those each day, and we now start to classify them into small, big, large, and we only send large ones. You know, the first few you get very excited, after that you get really, really uh, uh, become a nuisance. Uh, okay, so, and also the generation trip uh, report, you typically sends out maybe twice a day for all the system combined. So that's not too, uh, too much. So this one gave you a good picture of where the groupings are. This is EI. If you look at the vertical, this is showing which units are reporting, because not everyone is reporting. Typically, you get the PMUs to report maybe half of the time, sometimes. But in this case, uh, I think we usually get about 80 or more than 80% to report data, and they, they, they can stop for all kinds of reasons, GPS being one of them. Not because of scooping, because of the weather. Um, this clearly shows three clusters. You can further classify this, but it's probably not worth it because the magnitude gets so low. And that's one group, another group, and third group in terms of mode shape. Okay. All right, so we, we talked about major event. We talked about uh, oscillation and uh, some, something similar to uh, what actually Tom, you got your students working on is the line, tri uh, line trip detection, yeah. Uh, this one actually look at the frequency. I think you, you guys were looking at the angle quite a bit on there. We were looking at angle. All right, yeah. So we look at the frequency and whenever you islanded the frequency characteristics between the main group or between group one and group two are quite drastically different. You know, you ought to see some balance change. And uh, so that's one case in the EI, the top one. And the bottom one is uh, in WECC, you see a islanding and then eventually came back. Uh, this on the right hand side is the magnified version where the, the 
when they, the system break apart. Okay, so you can actually easily de detect islanding uh, without problem. Uh, and the same thing you can actually do uh, for UPS system. So we have a project which basically concentrating on how to detect and report and time uh, the critical infrastructures here in terms of hospital data centers and we have a centralized way to find out if they're off the grid, how long they've been off the grid, because you have limited fuel supply, you know. And then when did they come back to the grid? So that's one of the system. And this is what they put together for HHS. Basically, uh, you have different alert levels when you are on GP UPS, where you uh, could be on back to the grid again of monitoring. Okay, now phasers are angles, and the angles are basically indicators for the flow, okay? So we have a live uh, calibrated, because the angles at your house, my house, are not really the angles we should be looking at. However, the angle change uh, is significant. Remember, it doesn't really matter where, right? So this one is basically angles at all the FDR locations, but it gets translated into the bus, high voltage bus system. But you, you can do a EMS dump and the map all your FDRs to the high voltage, you know, the nearest high voltage bus. So you, you assume you have a constant offset, which does drift. Yeah. So uh, let me see if I can show you. This is the 24 hour angle uh, change. Ha ha, finally. <laughs> okay, so we couldn't play this one. Basically, we're saying, uh, what we should be saying is uh, the, the, the angle picture does uh, the form modifies and change, and uh, you can see the, uh, because the, the time of the day, the day of the week, and uh, you know, the, what season you're in, and uh, so this potentially, when it gets to the finer level, give you a good picture of the system stress or the operating um, modes you're in uh, by looking at the angle of the entire country in a very fine, uh, accurate way. Yeah. Uh, yes, you, Bill. You, you mentioned the uh, the difference between the angle in your house and my house and that kind of thing. What's the what's the Oh yeah, uh, there is no uh, there is no ideal way to translate yet. What we do is we get an EMS dump for the whole country. Then I know the angle uh, at the bus closest to my FDR. So and then look, I look at that angle, voltage angle. I look at my FDR. I basically move the remove the the difference constant constant. But since the system change, that's in drift. But somehow it give you a ballpark. Uh, yeah, but basically, you know, remember, part of our mission is education. So this gave you a good feel of roughly how they distribute. But one thing critical is the sudden change is always accurate in in that sense. Yeah. Okay, back to the line trip. Uh, so basically, we also look at the. Uh, line trip phenomena, but uh, we look at the frequency quite a bit, and we also look at the angle dr uh, jump. Uh, you, your case, I think I remember you were able to see the uh, in different lines. Here we kind of try to stay away from any system data because we don't. Uh, we assume there's no system data, and you basically have to observe everything based on your measurement only, and no topology information. And uh, so you should be able to get very good uh, indications, especially you have enough of those units of where things happen, and you can also sort of triangulate where it happened in your system, which line. You can actually pinpoint the line. Yeah. What does it mean on the WAP on the On the WAP, what does it mean? Unwrap. What does that mean? Oh, unwrap. Okay, good, good point. Uh, well, the remember the six when when we look at the angle, it goes to two pi and then come back, right? So there's a discontinuity. 
when it gets to 2 pi, it's actually zero, right? So when you get the uh, angle signal, it's actually like a tooth. It does that. And it's not continuous. So basically, you have to compensate that by wrapping it, uh, by take out away the distance, the 2 pi is zero, because that's one point, and then make it a smooth curve. So that's what they call the unwrap process. Okay, so we've been playing with it for the stability analysis, and we try different things, and one of things, of course, is the standard way of, you look at the center of uh, inertia, you look at the, for a bunch of measurements, angle, here I mean, and then you look at who is deviate from that in terms of uh, sudden change, so that's one way. We also look at the high order derivatives. That's when we find out the PMU data are, uh, or FDR data are not accurate enough, and we're going to need much higher uh, accuracy levels in terms of getting those useful stability analysis, at least the ways, you know, the method, some of the method we're using. And that's another reason that motivate us. I get a chance to see uh, some of your development. Maybe we can work together in terms of getting the higher precision uh, measurement uh, for the next generation. Uh, okay, another thing interesting we look at is the how do we use uh, the measurement information in terms of control or prediction. And one thing we studied, which uh, is the transfer functions between any other between any arbitrary points in the power grid. The reason I want to do that is I wanted to be able to uh, make up for a PMU if it's suddenly lost, and I like to be able to predict what it should be measuring if it were actually functioning, okay? So it's a very simple concept. Um, you assume the power grid is reasonably linear or dominantly linear, and you assume that 2,000 megawatt loss, it's a small disturbance. Uh, indeed, it is, I can, I can prove that, yeah. It's not a major disturbance, it's a very small disturbance, even it's 2,000, 3,000 megawatt, okay? So basically, you can use uh, disturbances in the power grid as your uh, stimuli, as your delta function. You poke the grid with that stimuli, and you look at the input, output, a ratio and you calculate the transfer function of your power grid. And with the transfer function, once you know another excitation, you can predict the response. And so that's the, the concept we're playing with. You can do that for voltage, you can do that for frequency signal, you can do that for angle signal as well. So it's been playing with uh, all kinds of combinations. You can, you can use generation trip as your stimuli or for, to perturb your system, you can use load shading as well as line fault uh, for perturbing the system. And you can actually get arbitrary transfer functions between any arbitrary points or between multiple points as well. Okay. So we're hoping to make use of this and uh, to be able to get into the control, control step. I don't know how yet. All right, so here, this is a basically a I'm watching my time. A summary of what uh, we've been looking at uh, in terms of uh, measurement based online grid condition system and toolbox. And we look at the event uh, location, we look at the stability prediction, and this is showing basically the high order approach. You can actually predict stability very simplistically if you have very accurate. Uh, measurement, you just keep doing the uh, derivative and uh, playing with the, uh, the pl uh, plot them in a uh, 2D space. Um, you would also argue, okay, what if the system condition change? What if I don't have a uh, stimulus, right, to excite the system? How do I deal with the transfer function? And a lot of study done by Dan Tunaski and others is look at the ambient data. Remember, the ambient is actually constantly being pro perturbed by load change, other switching actions in the power grid. So your grid is constantly being to pre uh, perturbed, and all your characteristics, natural frequencies, should be showing up, and it is, they do. 
Now here is the online display. Should have made this a little bigger. Okay, so on the very okay, I'm looking for the mouse. Okay, so on the second row on the very left, you are saying uh, is a online generated plots of uh, the modes, basically frequencies of the oscillations in your grid, and the second diagram showing the damping. Damping is extremely hard to predict based on the ambient data. And the third diagram basically showing at a different resolution, you know. Uh, if I change my window size, I get mm, more, a lot more uh, resolution, but uh, a lot of noise involved, okay? So basically, this is a rough summary of what you do uh, related to the power grid uh, with those kind of measurement. There's a lot more you can explore. and. So those are related to online applications, and there's a lot of things you can do in terms of offline model validation, and that's the obvious one. And uh, this is showing, here is actually the, the 30,000 bus system of the EI generated results. This is the PSSE uh, dynamic model, and this is the true measurement. So they're off quite a bit. And after tuning the parameter, you can get a little closer. And this is as close as we have ever seen that you can do for the EI. And uh, the EI model is quite far from the uh, reality. And you can do model validation uh, with the measurement, obviously. Uh, some sidetracks that are interesting. Uh, we actually run a large program for audio authentication. You wonder why we do even do this. Well, it's all rooted back to the frequency. And uh, this shows when you look at the audio signal, you sh you see the the line, the tracks, and one of the track is 60 hertz. Okay, if you do a FFT of uh, someone's voice recording, you get this on the very top. And if you open up this region, you're going to see 60 hertz here. 120 here. Don't ask me why there's a 30. I still haven't figured out. Yeah. So 60 hertz is uh, the power frequency. 120 is the harmonic of the power. When you open this up, you can actually see they match exactly what the measurements are. OK, so basically, when you do audio recording, you do video recording, you get the power supply interference into your recording. And that becomes. Uh, uh, your evidence, uh, and that once you take that out and compare with the power grid frequency, you can do a match, and you can detect the location, the time, and if, if it ever been tempered. Has, has it been used in court? Not in the court yet, but we're doing this for. This happened to be the Houston Police Department. We're doing it for preparing the. Basically, the, this is not in the court yet. The reason because we have to have, a, uh, you have to have, a, like the DNA, you have to have a way to say, okay, this gave me uh, the confidence level of how much. Very precise. So we're coming up with that uh, way of saying that. Yeah. So you can, but you're saying, okay, I'm, I'm okay if I just make a cell phone recording, right? I don't connect to power grid. And likely, your, your cell phone recording also have the power grid signature in it, usually 120 to 40. You, you're not connected to it. How accurate do you get this? Um, they depends on the recording device. So, so a w another way to answer your question is, if you happen to have a very clear audio, record, uh, audio recording that has a very good a strong signal source near it. It could be a cell phone. You you're happen to be in the room that get coupled in there. You can get to a second level. That means I only need one second of the audio to be able to match my frequency. Enough wiggles to, to match. How accurately can you get the frequency? The, the frequency usually you... Is it 100 I think it's probably close to that level. 
hundreds of, uh, yeah, you know, 10 milli, uh, millihertz is about hundreds of hertz. So that's about the level you get to. Remember, our source is much more accurate. You know, we use PMU and the FDR for the source, but the, the, the target is usually le much less accurate, the audios. So that's one uh, twist. I'll skip the uh, Super Bowl. Ba um, basically here, it says that, you know, during, you have three grid, and they should uh, respond, th their frequency signature should be arbitrary. However, during certain events, they swing together. And you're gonna see all the system signature swing together because, uh, you know, main, uh, human behavior. You run to the bathroom together at the same time in, during halftime. Yeah. Or you go to the refrigerator at the same time. And of course we look at all kinds of the, people look at the OJ same thing, people look at the soccer game, and my student went to the extreme to mark the first and the second kiss during the royal wedding, showing the frequency differ, how they differ between ordinary days and, uh, and non-typical. This is actually one week of different weeks, one of the weeks including the day that has the activity. Um, I mentioned to some of uh, uh, our people, uh, we also, being a high voltage training myself, and I always wanted to study magnetic field, electric field. Okay, and here we go. So EPRI funded this project, and uh, basically you do measurement without touching anything. You, do, you get it from electric field and magnetic field. You can do PMUs by taking the field measurement and get the results. Which is challenging because you, you, how close are you from the line is a really a, a hard, arbitrary issue, it's a calibration. But in our case, we don't care because we only wanted the frequency and angle. None of them are affected by the magnitude. Yeah. So that's something uh, interesting we're working on. And uh, I will send Pete or, uh, a copy. Actually, you have a copy of this. And uh, finally, you never should forget about thanking your sponsors and the friends who help us, uh, including uh, our school here who hosts our, uh, one of our FDRs. Actually, one of the dots is in, which, not this building, right? But it's on campus, it's in your uh, computer lab, yeah. So uh, I think I uh, wanted to conclude, and uh, I don't know if we take questions. We do? Okay, good. I have a question from online. Okay. Uh, the question was, uh, is it possible to get historical FNET data for correlating with uh, weather and other atmospheric events? I think once you guys tell me a time, you know, I actually I was talking to Prosper, he wants to have a data related to Fiddler. I said, if you give me a time, I can go in and get a chunk of data and then be able to uh, you know, send it to you. This is a person on my, not from Keats and Keys, but we'll connect. Very good, yeah, not a problem, yeah. Right. Yeah, I, uh, you know, as long as people don't ask to, has to stream data, it's always easy, yeah. Go ahead, Carl. Yeah. Uh, quick question, uh, you mentioned that uh, we need to improve the, uh, performance of PMUs, can you give us kind of order of magnitude uh, improvements that are needed? I think we need one, about one order of magnitude uh, in terms of uh, accuracy level. Or another way uh, we're dealing with is we get about 40 dB in terms of noise level and uh, uh, signal to noise ratio. And, but at that signal to noise ratio, our accuracy, you know, if you have a pure signal, our, our PMU's FDR can be perfect. I mean, very accurate. It's really the noise issue. It's when you have something like 20 dB, even 40 dB usually at the transmission level, uh, the, the measurement come out to be marginally useful for a lot of angle, angle applications. So if we can get one order of magnitude better in terms of, in, in the frequency measurement we get about um, 0 0.0005, which is the accuracy, millihertz, uh, you know, hertz. If I can get anything, Lango or frequency, just one order magnitude better, 
I, I think we were getting to very realistic application level, yeah, from what we're uh, used to today, yeah. Fat, fascinating talk. I, I always enjoy your presentations. The the thing about the the comment you had about the frequency being picked up in the background was so interesting. <laughs> it's like oh. I never thought about that, but it. it when you say it, it, it certainly makes sense. It makes perfect sense, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So my question is on the FNet data, and Prosper is one of the guys, he's a former student, so if... Yeah. He told me about that. Yeah. Yeah. I, we would like to get access to FNet data, like a lot of data, because I think of dating mine, mining applications, and I'll follow up with you afterwards when we meet together. Um, but a, a question is... Um, well, I guess is that possible to get like bulk data? Because you're you're generating a lot of data, and there's a lot of cool things that can be done with it, well beyond what just one research group can do. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, how much do these monitors cost? So if I, how how much, or do you sell them? If you do, how much? We yeah, we actually build systems for other groups, we actually building a system for Egypt, actually. Um, but they're all constantly, actually MISO, about 28 of them. They're, we, we, usually, we never really build them to sell, we just build them to, to use them. But they're all constantly, people wanted to have them, so we have always been giving them a price of 2500 each. So whenever someone needs some, we say, here's the price, you write a check to the department, uh, as a donation or whatever, we build those for you. So you, we actually make them. The Open PDC has a, a FNAT protocol. So all the Open PDC can take FNAT data as, as a standard stream, although we don't use uh, the single phaser uh, protocol because we have very limited data. It's really too much overhead if we use the single phaser protocol. But the Open PDC does take care of that. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, uh, Prosper uh, from University of Illinois. Uh, my first quick question is, uh, we are familiar with a uh, uh, wide area power grid, but I saw uh, somewhere at the notion of ultra wide area. Uh, what does mean, what is the difference uh, with this new notion, ultra wide area power grid? Mm. I think it's coming from the current, the definition of a current project. Why the word ultra in front of Oh, oh, why ultra? Huh, that's interesting. Actually, we try to stress that, you see, um, we, the reason we try to use plenty of words there is to make sure people pay attention to the word wide so that they wouldn't see this is another uh, project that interface renewables at the distribution level. We try to overemphasize the, it's a great level. So really, you don't lose anything after you take out the outro. Uh, it, it's wide area. Except yeah. the current. <laughs> the name, current. Except the current, yeah, actually, that's true, yeah. Actually, we got outro first before we got current. One of the students said, well, why don't we just call it current? remove one R, and that is really, really a disaster because <laughs> the constantly people adding the R to it was one, yeah. Well, Lynn Preston likes it, so we're good. <laughs> I, I think it, it's a nice word, you know, current. Yeah, uh, my second question is, uh, uh, you have uh, a nationwide uh, deployment of devices, uh, FNET, which is uh, reading some information sending to one location? Two locations, actually, one at UT, one at Oak Ridge National Lab. They're backup, sort of backup each other for redundancy, yeah. I, uh, I suppose that you might be facing the problem like uh, privacy. Uh, can you tell us if you have uh, uh, been dealing some time with the privacy issue and uh, if it is what is the problem, you know, are they asking or they are, you know, advocating for? Yeah, I, I don't know, you're, you're talking about the, the resident, let's say I have a unit in your home, right? And I might know when you open up your refrigerator. 
but do you care at that level? It's too abstract to be an issue for people, I think, yeah. It hasn't came to us as a privacy issue yet. Yeah. Okay, my last one uh, will be, um, uh, do you have at this time uh, some parameter for the uh, five bus uh, network equivalency of Eastern Interconnect? <coughs> Do we have a sample of the five? Uh, yeah, the parameter inside the, the different. Oh, the, the, the simplified model? Yes. Yes, we do. I'd be happy to share you, but I don't guarantee it's, Thank you so much. it's accurate. Uh, just, just playing with it. Yes, sure. Be happy to, to give you. Yeah. It's actually derived based on the measurement because we see how which generator belongs to which cluster. So it's, it's good in that sense, but. <laughs> But uh, it's definitely oversimplified, yeah. Yilu, it part is. of our mission here in TCIPG is cybersecurity. Can oh, you, I know you're gonna hit me with that. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about the possible threats or the possible problems that could happen if someone decided to alter your data or hack into your system? Yeah, I think I was talking with Tim, and he, he gave me a lot of insight. You know, what is, you know, he, he helped give me a real good picture of what is cyber, uh, how you look at it from different layers, point of view, like an onion. And that's what I pictured. Uh, yes, it's really, uh, you know, right now the PMUs are not closed loop. So the only thing damage you can do is basically make your data uh, uh, skewed and or you lose your uh, measurement for a period of time. But once they close the loop, then it becomes very significant, right? So uh, from the point where the data is taken, which is why you guys are working on the GPS, uh, you know, security spoofing issue, the data taken to the point where the data gets sent out and to the PDC, and then from the PDC, could be a substation PDC to other central locations, and it gets to the algorithm of translating data into the intelligence, and it gets to become command, it gets to relays, and then get to the actuators, breakers. And this whole spectrum uh, of, you know, every stage has to be secured. So if I look at this, this is a total complete spectrum of uh, a cyber issue that we should visit from device level, from communication level, protocol level, all the way to, you know, it, it involves so much along the path when you talk about the day when we close the loop and the dual control with it. It, it, it is, you know, just, just all you have to do is you just jam the GPS, all, all the GPS is out and that disable all the synchronization. That's why we keep emphasizing, you know, eventually we have to use something more secure, like atomic clock and other things to, in order for the timing. Otherwise, it's really uh, uh, very, uh, it's very weak in many, along many pa uh, passes that you could get uh, attacked, both physically and cyber. You uh, mentioned that you're uh, FNet data is about 80% available. What have you learned about the uh, the quality of data, and how do you or what do you attribute quality issues to? 80% uh, in the sense that um, we send a unit over, uh, and then they may have GPS issues. So 80% in the sense that I have. Let's say I have 100 out there, 80% are sending data. Uh, the 20%, the this is a rough estimate, the 20% are some in transition, and some uh, kids pull the antenna out, remember some of them are in homes. And some has uh, GPS issues, some have uh, communication issues. We, one thing we encounter quite often is, see they, those devices are not supposed to be sending data just by burst, right? They're supposed to be on continuously. But many of the things are not designed for continuous operation. So the network, actually, we a lot of times we have to reboot the system because the communication paths get stuck, 
I, I don't really know exactly why. Many of the things we have to do is to just re turn off the device and turn it back on again, and everything um, is back uh, again. So some units never have to reboot, and there's some units you have to go with, uh, you know, constantly needed attention. So a combination of those things uh, gave us the you know, a rough percentage. And then, even the da some of them sending data, they may lose data. And then, so you get, uh, um, you, you might get, you know, for the good ones, you could get uh, about 3% or 1 to 3% of data somehow just disappear. And also, when you have the GPS transition, uh, at 12 o'clock, a certain time of the day, when the satellite uh, in, in certain orientation, you have a wake GPS signal and you, you might be on coasting. So we have one hour coasting. So if you lose one hour, you coast that much, and beyond that, we stop sending data. So all those factors play a role in the data integrity yeah. and availability. Yeah. Okay, yes, Bill. we have a couple of questions online here. Uh, how do you get initial angle to get to get the angle? Uh, I assume a change in angle is easy to calculate using frequency. And also, how does FNet accuracy relate to angle measurement compared to PMU? Okay, um, I am not precisely no. Uh, I I'm not fully understand the first part of the question. Let me answer the second part of the question. We actually uh, took a measurement when I was at Virginia Tech. Uh, we look at the FNAT device. We look at the five, actually four PMUs. Uh, we look at the frequency. Remember, the, f the PMUs are not designed in order to do the frequency. It's their byproduct. Some use. Uh, zero crossing, some use other very simplistic ways to, to do the frequency part. So, so I, I don't want to blame them for not uh, as accurate as what we are trying to achieve because we are targeting the frequency initially. Is. So, so, so at least at that point, the FNAT devices are, uh, have, would give us much more accuracy, better accuracy than the PMU frequency I would say mostly because they are de not designed to uh, for the frequency part because of the angle part. Uh, in terms of angle, it's almost it's the same way we you, you calculate the um, PMU angle. The PMU you have three phase, so you do uh, uh, a vector in space, right? And Arturo should be an expert. You, you need to answer that question. And for the FNet, it's because a single phase, so you have a, a different alternated. Uh, Method, or you can do the, you can still pretend to be a three phase. You just create other phase and do using the PMU uh, algorithm. So, so for the angle, it's almost identical approach. Yeah. Um, I was interested about the availability uh, numbers you quoted as well, and I wonder if you have any insight. I think you used the term "just disappears." Uh, that other data, I wondered. Uh, where the where the uh, unavailable data was going and what the uh, source of unavailability is, you believe. Yeah. So I'm thinking about the infrastructure, maybe. <laughs> good, good, good. I think that's you, and you're the one we need also uh, turn to to get help. Uh, let me follow up on this one because we did that study uh, a while back. And actually, we have some explanation. I don't remember uh, as of now. So what I would like to do is to be able to dig up the report. A student did a summary of all the data availability and where they think they are. And uh, we can follow up on that one. I don't want to quote uh, numbers that I, didn't, yeah, that I don't trust my memory for. Yeah. I think we're we're done with questions, and let's thank uh, Yi Lu Lu for a fine presentation. All right. And that concludes our initial seminar for the fall semester. Join us uh, in the month of October, the first Friday, at one Central Time.